so next speaker is Giacomo. Um, yeah, have fun. Oh, thank you. Yes. As you, as you can as you can hear, there, is, there are a lot of Italian attendees. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Giacomo Zucca, and yes, I do have a fetish problem with my, the Matrix movie, as you can see. But uh, I mean, the content will be more professional. Uh, I uh, am a theoretical physicist. I worked uh, for Accenture as a technology consultant, and now I'm working for BHB Network, which is a kind of a bridge uh, between uh, free open source development uh, and research uh, on Bitcoin protocol and the world of the incumbents. Uh, these guys have uh, the money, uh, the other guys have the knowledge, and we try to do arbitrage between, uh, between these two worlds. Uh, I mean, uh, we, it's win-win, completely win-win. They want the knowledge and they can use the money. Uh, so that's what we do. And uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about the security challenges and implications on one of the aspects of this relationship between uh, uh, Bitcoin, technical knowledge, and financial incumbents, which is the uh, relationship uh, between traditional banks uh, and the activity of uh, uh, being a Bitcoin custodian. Uh, so you all know about uh, this uh, nice meme. This, uh, this is a a t-shirt, uh, a very nice t-shirt from Crypto Graffiti. We have this t-shirt, we have the stickers on our PC, of course not the same PC we use with clients, but we, uh, <laughs> on other PCs we, we have the sticker. Uh, we all, always uh, share this, uh, this uh, rhetoric some, in some way, and we do believe that, for example, Bitcoin will be a very funny problem for central banks, including China central banks, eventually. And they could be some kind of a problem uh, also for even for commercial banks uh, in the long run. But what is not uh, maybe apparent for everyone is that in the short run, they could be uh, also interesting and positive interaction between commercial banks, uh, uh, traditional banks, and Bitcoin activity. To try to explain this, uh, I, will, I will rule off immediately the idea that we, I'm going to talk about uh, a blockchain-based tool for managing traditional assets. Uh, I, I was searching for a uh, face palm icon, but I'm, I actually decided to use the double face palm icon. Uh, there could be something interesting there. I'm uh, not saying that there's nothing interesting about uh, uh, banks using blockchain tools in order to move traditional assets. There could be something, maybe in the future, we are working about something like that with, with some of the people here, but uh, in the short run, what is really interesting and really underestimated is the other way around. The use of uh, traditional uh, established uh, banking tools in order to manage uh, and to serve blockchain-based assets. And when I say blockchain-based assets, I just mean Bitcoins, of course. Uh, but it's a, it's a sexy way to, to say it. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, we, I mean, there could be something there, but we are focused, maybe there is the laser, yeah. We are focusing here for, uh, for this talk. So, what's, uh, what's, what is a Bitcoin user? My, I will try to make the point that there are at least two kind, at least two types of di very different Bitcoin users. One kind of Bitcoin user is the direct Bitcoin user. Uh, is basically looking for financial sovereignty and uh, censorship resistance and be basically permissionless finance. Uh, from, the, from the black markets to the international e-commerce to machine to machine payments, all the markets that are maybe too new to be complied with regulation or maybe too, too global, too much global to be fully compliant with all the regulations or all the markets that don't want to be compliant with the regulation. That's a perfect application for direct Bitcoin use and for its uh, main features, which are very important. Uh, so this, uh, this drives uh, a, a demand for, for Bitcoin because people do need uh, permissionless finance. So they do need Bitcoin and, not, and nothing else. And in, since they do need Bitcoin, and since we have a scarce supply of Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin rises, and, and that's good for everybody owning Bitcoin. But there, are, there is another category of users. They are, these are just, uh, this is what I call 
type two uh, Bitcoin users, Bitcoin investors, they do not, they live in a country which uh, uh, so far doesn't have a lot of inflation problems or, uh, or capital seizure problems or uh, actually they can pay their coffee with a credit card, which is pretty scalable. Uh, and uh, they have a lot of means to pay and to store money. They actually just want to invest in an asset because they think that the price of the asset will go up it is actually in the long run, uh, or even because it's just uh, un not correlated. So even if the price is not always going up, the not correlation with the traditional asset class is very interesting for a traditional investor. Uh, I, I, I'm arguing that this kind of uh, Bitcoin user is interesting and is actually beneficial for the ecosystem because they are putting a lot of money in Bitcoin and we do own Bitcoin and that's good. Uh, so <laughs> the first type of uh, user they need uh, a lot of stuff. They need uh, a safe uh, way to store uh, uh, their private keys. If, it's not say, if the private key is not guarded enough, everybody can, uh, can take it and use it uh, with a lot of plausible deniability. And if they, I mean, if they are a little bit more uh, cautious than the empty gox uh, uh, money lander, they, they will probably not be caught. Uh, but uh, they also, if they store their private key uh, too much safely, they will not use it anymore, and uh, sorry for your loss. So it's, it's a problem, it's a hard problem. They, they need to use open source, uh, heavily reviewed software, because otherwise, uh, no matter where you put your private key, if you don't know what the software or the hardware is doing, uh, they need uh, some basic, at least basic understanding of the technology, otherwise they will just mess up with uh, fees, coin selection, and they need to protect their privacy, so use uh, maybe Tor connection. There are a lot of problems for direct Bitcoin users. Uh, it will be a long road to have a mass adoption of this application. Maybe people that need this application more, they, they will be fast to learn, but they have to learn. On the other hand, for the second, for the type two users, uh, what they need in order to invest in Bitcoin is their good old usual uh, established uh, boring uh, financial intermediary. They want to uh, take, uh, take the phone, they want to manage this new asset class along with the existing asset class. They just want to call a bank and ask the bank, please, I want to invest in Bitcoin because it's not correlated and because it's going to the moon. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the idea is that in order to serve this type two of uh, Bitcoin users, uh, I don't know, if you don't want to call them Bitcoin users, it's legit, it's just a definition, call it Bitcoin investors. Uh, if, you, if you're going to serve the, them, you have basically two possible approaches. You can have a Bitcoin startup, so here the rocket of the startup, and uh, uh, you, have a lot of, you have a lot of assets, a lot of pros, like uh, you have some technical knowledge, you have a knowledge of the market, OTC, uh, Bitcoin sellers, you, you love risk, you are going to take risks, but uh, you don't have a strong marketing instrument, not, not as strong as traditional uh, uh, financial incumbents, you don't have trust of the general traditional investor, uh, you, are, uh, you are naive about the specific domain, you don't know how a fund, I mean, I don't, I pretend to know what is a financial fund or a bank account, I don't know, I have no idea. Uh, th there was nothing about that on Bitcoin Toll, so I, I, I didn't learn. And, uh, uh, there are a lot of regulatory risks that they are not prepared to assess and to, and to, and to stand. Uh, and also they don't have the tools, they don't have the insurance uh, policies, they don't have uh, very complex uh, security protocols. On the other hand, you have the traditional banks. So of course these, uh, these guys have some problems, they don't know the market, but they can uh, know it, uh, I mean they can uh, learn pretty quickly. They don't know the tech and they will be probably a little bit slow to learn it. Uh, they are more risk adverse, they don't like uh, reputational risk or uh, legal risk, so they, they are not sure they want to, everybody wants to be second in this business, nobody wants to be first, so there is a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of deep thought about if they are going to do this or not, but the thing is that it's a race. Uh, they won't they want, want to target these users, and the thing is, uh, or uh, start some kind of Bitcoin startups are trying to become uh, more and more similar to banks, and some kind of banks are trying to, uh, to, to, to get a little bit free and uh, to aggress this type of, uh, of users. Uh, so we think, as you can see by the count of pros and cons, uh, our vision is that these guys, uh, at least in some parts of the world, 
have probably the, uh, the strong uh, hand in this uh, race because they have more assets than the, these other guys and because the, the asset that they miss, they can, they can probably, uh, they can probably uh, correct the, the situation uh, easily. Uh, actually, this is happening now. Uh, this, mine is not a theoretical speech. Right now, we have, uh, we have contract, uh, contracts to do this uh, with, uh, for our discussion or contracts, in the first case, is contracts uh, with uh, different banks in Italian part of Switzerland. That could be for some uh, geographical bias, but also there is also a systemic uh, reason for that. Some banks in, uh, in Geneva, uh, two banks in Zurich, one is not actually talking with us. They are doing stuff with other people. The other one is talking with us. And there was this bank in Norway, you know, about they are, they are just uh, integrated with Coinbase. And there is one bank in Italy we just signed it with uh, a few days uh, ago. And uh, there, are, there are some banks in Australia doing something like this, but it's, this is the Vulcan situation. This is a little bit more complex, and I'm not to talk about that right now. So this is actually happening. Uh, and uh, what we see is that the security implication of, uh, of, uh, of this scenario are not actually really bad at all, uh, meaning that uh, for this kind of user, there, we, we are not facing the option between uh, uh, transforming uh, every one of them in hackers or just uh, having them not accessing the investment. They will do invest in Bitcoin, and their choice is between doing that, doing that using untrusted and uh, uh, unskilled counterparties or trusted and skilled counterparties. So uh, if we assume that there are not trivial uh, security implication, these implications are very different uh, in very different uh, models. The first model that I try to, uh, that I try to uh, sum up in this, uh, in this presentation is the exchange-based model. So it's like the Norwegian, Norwegian bank. Actually, uh, basically you have the users uh, buying Bitcoin through, through a bank, through different banks, and all these banks are just integrating to uh, a Bitcoin exchange, buying Bitcoin on the exchange, storing Bitcoin on the exchange. And as you have seen on the previous presentation, this, this doesn't always end very, very well. And, uh, and relying on the, on the knowledge of this Bitcoin exchange. So the thing is that, as you can see, usually you have the, this symbol of the bank at the center, the center counterparty. We, this is the opposite case, because we have many banks, there are many little banks that are trying to address this, uh, this kind of business uh, case, and you have very few uh, regulated exchanges that can actually interact with them. Basically, there are, there are three uh, strictly regulated uh, uh, exchanges that can operate in Europe so far. Uh, and uh, using an integration like this is actually concentrating the risk over, uh, 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 is basically adding more risk and more risk on a situation which is already very risky, which is a full custodian exchange uh, that uh, doesn't have the possibility to uh, cover every, uh, every possible, possible uh, attack surface. So this is the model which is uh, going on in, on some places. And uh, I'm arguing that is not really super optimal. Uh, the second possible model is a vault-based model. So instead of using an exchange as a vault, they, the banks will use different exchanges to trade, to sell, and to buy, and they will rely on a single Bitcoin startup, which, is, which is, uh, has born only to do that, and to do that with, uh, with institutional players. Uh, something like, uh, I don't want to, uh, to, to tell names, but a little bit example like uh, oops, sorry uh, so uh, this is the Bitcoin based startup they own all the keys their job is to own the keys but still they are not regulated to do so they are not insured to do so they still have a lot of challenges that their counterparty will not have uh, the third model uh, is uh, the provider based model so in this model the banks are actually keeping their keys uh, uh, in their uh, IT infrastructure, but they're using a single uh, in security infrastructure from a Bitcoin startup, could be something BitGo style, uh, that will actually provide all the security infrastructure only, uh, uh, distributing only the attack, sur the, the, the attack surface of the keys themselves. Uh, I'm arguing that this is, not, this is not the best model, and that the best model is possibly a knowledge-based model in which basically, in, at least in the, in the medium uh, run, the banks, the, the IT of the banks, will be able to manage uh, the infrastructure themselves with the keys and with everything 
only loosely interacting with uh, uh, with Bitcoin startups uh, uh, for uh, uh, the the best uh, selection of uh, best practices and industrial uh, standards. You know, Glacier Protocol, uh, Ledger Vault. There are a lot of examples of good practices and standards. So the idea that we are trying to push is that they should probably just learn the best standards and to interact with many different uh, uh, Bitcoin startups in order to to build in the next years their own security infrastructure, not relying on a single central Bitcoin-specific counterparty. So this is the general uh, philosophical uh, take on the security implication of what's happening. We are not super sure that uh, everything I'm saying is actually true. Uh, we will discover what's bad and what's not. But the idea is that we, we want to, decentral to, yeah, to distribute and decentralize the risk, uh, the, 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 the attack surface. And the first model is actually concentrating the, the risk over a single, a single, uh, single point of failure. So what are the, uh, uh, oh, yeah, we, right now we are providing a very simple model because uh, these banks are paying, but they are not paying very much. Uh, they are waiting to see how is, how is this market going. So they are just paying uh, in, order to, uh, for, in order for us to provide them a security procedure, some knowledge, workshop, security pro procedure, where we just explain them what's the best open source software out there, what's the best uh, uh, user grade, uh, consumer grade hardware they can use. So uh, a ledger or a trezor with uh, maybe a core, uh, core instance with some, uh, uh, some particular scripts uh, with multisig and uh, check time verify. So we are providing something uh, safe enough, in our opinion, uh, and we are trying to ask as per people to help us in, in, in this kind of assessment. Uh, but if this, uh, if this stuff goes well, the idea is that we will probably be able in a few months to see uh, the development of uh, uh, enterprise-grade uh, software, enterprise-grade wallets, and enterprise-grade hardware for those wallets uh, that can habilitate a lot of, uh, of uh, advanced function like uh, um, I mean, time control over uh, withdrawals or stuff like that. Uh, and also, they can, th this kind of scenario could habilitate the semi-custodian scenario, which is a hybrid between uh, the, the type 1 and type too. Maybe you are a Bitcoin user that wants to, to control the key, but you also want a counterparty to, to give you a second security signature, or maybe in the long run you want a backup signature so, is that, so that if you lose your key, you will have your bank signing for you. So there still is something like this, even if it's not trivial at all. What are the security challenges? Uh, yeah, I know the press is sometimes, uh, if you need vomit bags, so, so sometimes can provide them. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I like Prezi. Uh, so, uh, security challenges are uh, mainly three, in, in our opinion. The first one, it's kind of trivial, but very, very, it's an art problem, is the trade-off between uh, usability and security. There will be a panel after speaking about that. That's a very hard problem. Uh, of course, uh, bank, uh, IT departments, uh, from banks, especially Swiss banks, especially Italian Swiss banks, is not exactly cutting edge technology. Uh, in general, IT sector don't w like to learn new stuff. Uh, they don't like to learn new technological stuff, and they don't like to learn new uh, technological security related stuff, uh, and Bitcoin stuff especially. Uh, it's very hard to, to, to do that. Uh, the problem is that uh, the more secure the procedure is, the more difficult uh, uh, at, at the basic level will be to implement. Uh, the more easy you do the, 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 the procedure, the more you are actually asking the user to, to trust you. So you are basically becoming a single point of failure. Uh, but the trade-off is not easy because if, the, if, you, if you just say, just say on, 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 the, on the right side of the trade-off, uh, we don't care about usability. You bank, you, you will have to suffer, no pain, no gain, just learn their way and, and please become a Bitcoin expert. The problem there is that if you ask this from them, what you, will get, what you will get will be the opposite effect. They will start to ignore your procedure, they will start to bypass your procedures, they will start to basically behave in the most possible uh, unsecure way because the secure way was too difficult to follow. On the other hand, if you go too easy, uh, you are basically uh, skipping important security uh, requirements. So th this is a very difficult problem to, to, to solve. And I, I don't think that we have seen uh, yet 
an optimal equilibrium, an optimal balance between these two approaches. Usually in the, in the Bitcoin world, the good guys are, are here and they, they are discovering the best security pr uh, procedures and they don't really care a lot about the, these. And the guys were uh, good to sell these from a marketing perspective, they don't have any clue about this. So uh, we have a very, uh, a, still a very immature uh, trade-off here. The second, uh, the second trade-off is, uh, is more subtle, and it's basically counterparty risk versus market risk. So uh, in my speech, I'm assuming, basically, that if a Swiss, banks, for a Swiss bank, for example, is able to store the physical goal of a client in their caveau, so they may as well be able to store the physical Bitcoin uh, in their uh, cold wallet, right? It's uh, from, a, from a legal point of view, it should be from a normative uh, regulatory point of view, it should be kind of similar. And also from a security practice point of view, it should be similar. I mean, these people is putting a lot of effort in defending the, uh, the, the, the jewelry or, uh, or, uh, or uh, beer instruments or a gold, uh, or gold coin of the, of the clients. So there is a tradition there about physical security. Uh, but it's not really like that because uh, Bitcoin is actually adding up a lot of uh, counterparty risk as any beer instrument which is a uh, kind of easy to steal, as we have seen in the, in the empty gas presentation, with a lot of market risk. So in order to explain what I mean, uh, I just created a very scientific uh, looking graph. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, I mean, the, the, the um, unit of measure are not very clear. But what I'm, what I'm meaning here is that uh, assume a gold, a gold vault, just a, a gold vault. Uh, you have a lot of counterparty risk because uh, you can have the, uh, the, 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 the pirates or, uh, or anyone coming in to, to steal your gold and you have uh, plausible deniability about that, you, have, uh, you cannot undo a physical gold transaction, you can have an assault to the, to the, bus transport, to the, to the car transporting uh, gold, but you don't actually have a lot of market risks with physical gold storage. For example, physical gold uh, has a very, compared to Bitcoin, of course, has a very easy to manage volatility, market price volatility. Uh, both in the long run, I mean, uh, gold will probably go down, then it will go up, uh, there will be asteroid mining, there will be Bitcoin competition, but it, it is here since uh, many thousands of years, and probably the long run movement will be pretty smooth, uh, at least uh, we can imagine that, so far it was like that. And especially in the short run volatility, uh, I mean, it's almost never a problem for a Swiss banks uh, guarding, hosting physical gold. Uh, the timing of delivery of the gold is not that when you, the, when you move the gold from a counterparty to the other, you have to put a lot of eff effort in managing the slippage, the financial slippage of that. The, the price of gold will not change drastically while you are moving from a cavo to the, to, the, to the other. Not at the same pace of Bitcoin price, at least. Uh, with Bitcoin, you have, uh, it's going to be better in the long run, but you have a lot of volati volatility you have to manage. Uh, and uh, also you have uh, splits. So imagine that you have uh, some uh, Chinese uh, mining equipment, uh, gold mining equipment uh, oligopolist, and he wants to, to create a magic uh, enchantment that will split all the gold coins in a two, all the gold, uh, every gold atom will split in a gold atom and in a scam gold atom. Uh, so this is uh, probably not going to happen. I, I, I am not, I'm a physicist, not a key, I don't know chemistry, but it's probably unlikely. Uh, and so we don't have this, uh, this huge market uh, risk to find our, go our physical gold uh, split in uh, one real physical gold and one, uh, uh, one scam physical gold. Uh, this, can be, this can be a problem. Uh, the, 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 the worst case scenario is that if you have a symmetric split. So you had the two gold atoms, now for each one you have, uh, you have one, and now for each one you have two gold atoms, and you don't know which one is the real gold, uh, and they are different, so that's, that's a mess. Uh, but uh, you can also have asymmetric split that are better, so you will have the original gold and some kind of scam gold, but still it's a problem because first you have to manage your relationship with the investor, with the, with the actual owner. Uh, how can, are you 
uh, assuming that you need a new kind of security vault to manage a new gold, uh, are you forced to build a new uh, vault uh, in order to comply with your customer requirements? It's a mess. And also, uh, this is just assuming a honest split. Let's assume a dishonest split. Let's assume that maybe a uh, venture uh, jewelry, gold jewelry, venture capital related American guy wants to create a new scam gold, but he wants it to be called gold in every relevant uh, trade. Assume this crazy scenario. If that happens, uh, now you are actually have a lot of problems to, to, I mean, to, to understand what gold means with, with your users. So uh, also you have another category, and, and go fast because so I leave some time for the questions. You have uh, problems with uh, attacks on fungibility. Gold, uh, physical gold is pretty fungible, at least if you melt it. Uh, so with Bitcoin, working on that. Uh, but there could be blacklist attacks, Vulcan, stuff like that. Uh, on the other hand, banks are already able to uh, manage this kind of risk. For example, for very illiquid, exotic derivative instruments. So it's not that banks are not able to manage these, but usually they manage this kind of risk when they have almost zero uh, counterparty risk because uh, a, a financial derivative is not very easy for an employee to steal it and to, and to hide it, uh, or, or for a, a pirate to, to break into a bank and steal all the derivatives. Uh, there are usually liability in other counterparty. So uh, in a way, you can reverse the transaction, you can track, it's easier. Uh, so this is a very difficult challenge. And uh, then we have the final challenge, who is the expert? So if we want to teach these uh, incumbents how to do stuff in a, in a good way, we have to, to tell them to ask the expert. Please ask uh, Cypherx uh, um, uh, or ask uh, Ledger, uh, Blockstream. But uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, who is the expert right now is a little bit circular uh, as a problem because uh, they are the expert because I tell the bank they are. But I am the expert usually because they tell the banks that I am. It's like, uh, it's like a web of trust game, which is very difficult to bootstrap. Eventually, it will go better with some kind of external validation, uh, trial and error. But right now, there is not a clear distinction between experts and scammers. If you go to a bank and you claim to be an expert on Bitcoin, they will probably believe you. Uh, uh, so. So these are the challenges and now questions. Uh, oh, no, sorry, I don't. <laughs> no, quest... Wrong slide. You know, Prezi, I'm not good with it, sorry. OK, question, anybody? Okay, well, I'll leave it. Okay, who cares? Okay, I will leave it. I will leave it there. I will leave it there for all the for all the. <laughs> Can it's, not, it's not so much subliminal anymore. So, how can you address the problem where banks don't know how to distinguish between a quote unquote true expert and someone who just claims to be one? Uh, I listed that as an open problem because uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, right now, we are trying to use uh, a little bit of. Uh, Time justice, I mean, uh, we try to, to tell our clients, uh, uh, I mean, we gave some, uh, one of our very important Italian clients a report about the risks of uh, crazy, complex, uh, solidity smart contracts uh, uh, six months before the DAO, and then we gave another report about the political risk of, uh, uh, of uh, arbitrary hard force in Ethereum uh, uh, one month later, and then about uh, scalability problems and DDoS attacks, and what happened then was wonderful because we were fully validated. But that was luck because it was very, very good timing. Uh, usually we will need time and we will be the probably more organized. I think that the best approach is, is to, use, to use some form of co-petition here. So, okay, we are a free market, uh, evil capitalist, uh, I get it. But uh, in this phase, there is a blue ocean, very few um, people able to do good stuff. So probably co open competition is the, the best way to do that. Uh, validate each other when, when, when that's, I mean, but that's correct, the, the, the right thing to do. And, uh, and to use an ecosystem approach and not a typical startup closed uh, segregated oops, approach. 
Anybody else? Nope. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.